Yes, okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, the inverse damping for monotonic shear flow. Uh, this is a recent uh, joint work with the Professor Nader Masmudi. So um, let's start with uh, the simplest model in the fluid dynamics, the incompressible Euler equation. So uh, the first equation, the mono, uh, momentum equation, is uh, uh, obtained by the Newton's second law. And uh, the second divergence free condition uh, equation is, uh, uh, is due to the, due to the uh, incompressible assumption. And uh, the third one, the boundary condition means that the flow will not go through the boundary. And of course we have the initial data. Here the V is the velocity and the P is the pressure. So this is the basic setting of the equation. So our domain is this D. Uh, I would like to introduce some classic results. It's uh, uh, the local well postness for the sublief space with S larger than one plus D over two. And also uh, there is a EO postness uh, result at the at the end point. So the S equals to one plus D over two is E opposed. Of course, there is a bridge between uh, local well posts and uh, uh, global existence or finite time, uh, finite time blow up. It's uh, the blow up criteria. Um, it's famous. So uh, it means that it, it says that the, um, when the velocity uh, become infinite at the time, T star, then um, the, the, the solution blow up at, that, at this capital T. If this capital T can be infinite, then you, you have a global solution. And uh, in, this pro, uh, in this talk, I will focus on the uh, two-dimensional case. And uh, the domain we are considering is the finite channel, as mentioned in the title. Uh, in the X direction is periodic, and there is a wall, A and B. It's a finite channel. And uh, in 2D case, of course, it's, in, it's natural to introduce the um, two-dimensional vorticity, so which is the curve of U. And uh, then the vorticity will satisfy a very nice e transport equation. And uh, we can also recover the V, the velocity here, by the stream function, per se. And the Psi is uh, solved by the Laplace Psi equal omega. So these two together uh, also has a name, which is called the uh, um, Biot-Sawat law. So the maximum principle of the transport equation gives us that the velocity or vorticity will be uniformly L, L infinity bounded by the initial data. So which gives the global well postness of the two dimensional Euler equation. I would like to mention that the 3D global well postness for the smooth initial data of the Euler equation, of, of course, the Navier Stokes equation are still open. That's uh, very, very hard. But okay, we are not uh, going to talk about the well postness theorem here. We are interested, interested in the uh, stability. So an, another object I, I will mention in this talk a lot is the shear flow. What is shear flow? Shear flow is a kind of flow V showed in this picture that uh, the first component, the horizontal uh, velocity is only depend on the vertical component. And uh, the vertical velocity is zero. So the velocity be, um, behave in this way. And uh, there are some famous shear flows, which uh, you can see that the coit flow which is U is linear depend on Y and uh, the Poisson flow, of course, the, another uh, famous flow called the uh, uh, Kolmogorov flow. Uh, there is a natural question. Are these shear flows stable? Of course, this is a uh, very hard to answer because uh, when you consider some things stable or not, you need uh, uh, take into consideration of several things. The first thing, of course, is the shear flow. 
what kind of share flow you are considering, uh, what's the property that the share flow satisfies, and uh, the second is uh, uh, what kind of topology you you are considering of the perturbation, and and uh, I I also want to mention that even the domain will affect to the stability, such as the, the, I mentioned here for the combo glue flow, if the periodic in X, the delta here changes, the, uh, when delta larger than zero, uh, larger than one, it's unstable, when delta smaller than one, it's stable. So it's a, it's a very complicated uh, um, thing to answer whether this is stable or not, but we have some, we have, we, we should have some result. So to answer the above uh, question, it is natural to introduce a perturbation. So let, this, let our V equals to the shear flow plus the uh, perturbation and the, the uh, vorticity be the vorticity of the shear flow plus the perturbation. Then the perturbation will satisfy the following equation. We also call it a all equation because it's a satisfied uh, all equation. If I, cons I go back to the omega. And uh, it has three parts. The first part is time derivative. And uh, the, se the second part is the linearized operator around this shear flow. And uh, the third one is a nonlinear term. And uh, no, uh, formally, if we regard this, uh, the perturbation is of size epsilon, then, sorry, um, then the nonlinear term is of size epsilon square. So let's keep the leading order term and drop the nonlinear term. So which gives us the linearized order equation of this form and the uh, u, the u here is uh, is uh, obtained by the Biot-Savart law. I would like to make uh, two notations. The first one is that if the uh, velocity u is uh, linear depend on y, such as the quiet flow, then we do not have this term, this non-local term. So the linearized Euler equation become a transport equation. Uh, second notation is uh, this linearized operator L is closely related to the famous Rayleigh operator, which of this form. You can see that if I take the Fourier transform in X, um, then replace X by alpha, we can get this Rayleigh operator. Okay, so let's also give the mathematical defini uh, definition of the stability and the instability. What is the stability? It means that for any, uh, there is a small coefficient uh, parameter epsilon. If this perturbation is smaller enough, then we can say that the solution also small in some other space. Maybe the same, the x, y may be the same, but uh, um, sometimes it's different. Uh, what is the instability? Of course, it's uh, uh, the other way. It means that uh, for any small, uh, for any epsilon small, you can always find a perturbation of this size epsilon and a positive time, such that the solution at that time become larger. The perturbation at that time become larger. Uh, this kind of the stability and the instability, uh, we have two, two different size. One is the linearized and the other one is nonlinear. So for the linear stability or instability, it depends on, it's closely related to uh, the spectrum of this linearized operator. Of course, the spectrum of the relay operator. In 1980s, Rayleigh proved that if the profile is convex, that then the shear flow has, is linear stable. Actually, he proved that the relay operator here has no glowing mode. So, um, in, in 1961, Howard proved that if you have some potential eigenvalues, then those, those eigenvalues 
which lead to the glowing mode, much located in this semicircle. So he actually, he proved that uh, all the uh, potential eigenvalues of this uh, relay operator located in this circle, and uh, all the glowing mode are living in the semicircle. So this is the famous Harvard semicircle theorem. Okay, so we would like to ask more. So what's the long time behavior of the solution if the initial data is a small perturbation around these shear flows? So actually, this, this is an asymptotic stability question. So um, there, are, there are several things you need to make sure uh, to, to keep in mind. The, the first thing is that uh, in our previous uh, slide, uh, we say that uh, we drop some nonlinear turn. So can we really drop this turn? So actually the, the nonlinear interaction will accumulate. Then if we really want to say that this nonlinear interaction is too harmless to the, to the system, it, uh, it may keep the, it also keep the system behavior like the linear solution, then we need to make sure that the nonlinear interaction decay as time goes to infinity. So this accumulator is, uh, is bounded. It's not, uh, it's not a go to infinity. So this is a syntactic stability. Before I want to, uh, before that, I want to like to introduce a, a very famous in, a phenomenon in this, in this stability of the flood dynamics, uh, which called the uh, inverse damping. What does it mean? It means that uh, the velocity will converge to its average. That's it. But it has uh, some strong type uh, uh, inverse damping, which means that the, the um, horizontal velocity will converge and to its average, the convergence rate is one over t. And uh, the vertical component of the velocity will decay to zero. The time, uh, the decay rate is one over t squared. It means that formally, some shear flow, you give a perturbation, then it converges back to the shear flow. These two shear flow may be different because you have the, the average here. In 1907, or predict the inverse damping for the quiet flow. So the simplest case, u y equal to y. In 2013, uh, and Masmudi they proved the nonlinear inverse damping for the quiet flow in Jewelry space. Later, Jia and the Anusku they they proved they they proved the uh, the inverse damping for the quiet flow in a, in a finite channel. Of course, they assume that the, the perturbation has some compact support. I would like to also to mention two negative results. The first one is a negative to the asymptotic stability, which mean, uh, which given by Lin and Zheng uh, in 2011. Uh, they said that, okay, there is a periodic solution, which is also close to the uh, quiet flow, which means uh, it means that the quiet flow here still stable, but it not converges to any shear flow anymore. It become a periodic, so it there is no decay, and uh, the, the the solution forms a very famous phenomenon which is called the cat's eyes. Another another step. Uh, Negative result is given by Dunn and Masmudi in 2018. Uh, they proved the instability of the quiet flow if the perturbation is some, some um, Jewelry space, uh, which is uh, less smoother than the Jewelry 2. Um, and uh, they proved that the, the highest, uh, some high sublift norm also become larger as time goes to some finite time. So that, so here I would like to mention the Jewelry space here is some space such that you take some derivative and the derivative will bounded by some 
k to the power m and this m, uh, this one over s. The s means that uh, the one over s is the Javery component. So Javery two means s equals to, s uh, s equals to um, two. Here, uh, what about the general shear flows? Um, in 1960, Case predicted the inverse damping for the monotonic shear flow. So this U become monotonic. Then we will have this term, the non-local term. So it's not, it's not that easy um, to say the inverse damping for the monotonic shear flow. In, in 2014, Zilling, he proved that if the shear flow is really close to the coit flow, then the inverse damping also holds. And in uh, one year later, uh, we, uh, with uh, Dong Yiwei and uh, Professor Zhang, we proved uh, uh, the inverse damping for monotonic shear flow, and uh, we obtained the same decay rate. Later, Jia gives a short proof, uh, which, uh, of course, is uh, quite uh, a uh, good phenomenon in that uh, proof. And uh, he also uh, proved that uh, the linear inverse damping in Javre space. Um, last year, I, uh, yes, in 2019, um, Deng and uh, Zeling, uh, they, 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 pr uh, they pu um, put some uh, a very interesting paper on a curve that uh, showed a toy model, uh, which is a linear instability. Actually, they, they just um, move several terms of this transport part and keep this part here. And uh, their instability coming from the resonant talk to resonant. This is a new phenomenon. I think they, they want to mention that this kind of the um, resonant talk to resonant also can lead to the linear instability. This is a very interesting um, result. And uh, what about the non-monotonic flow? Uh, this is the first uh, uh, predicted by Borchit and the Morita. They are, two, they, they are two, both of them are two uh, French uh, physicists. They use some, um, they use some uh, numerical as uh, argument to say that is to say that the uh, non-monotonic flow you can also obtain the linear inverse damping. Uh, another thing that they showed in their paper is so-called the vorticity depression. What does it mean? It means that the vorticity will converge to its average at the critical point. Um, the critical point means the uh, U prime equal to uh, U prime equal to zero uh, equal to zero because you are not uh, the flow is non monotonic. And later uh, with uh, Dong Yi Wei and uh, Professor Zhang, we also give a rigorous proof and uh, confirm the uh, inverse damping and the uh, vorticity depression. This is all for the uh, linear result. Uh, today I'm talking about the nonlinear inverse damping. So it's a nonlinear result. The so first thing is I want to uh, give, a, give the profile of this shear flow, which is of course a monotonic. And uh, the second one is a compact support. Uh, the U double prime has compact support. Uh, this is a very technical assumption that we want to uh, avoid the uh, boundary effect. The third one is a classic, is a linear stability assumption. And uh, the fourth one is a Javery um, regularity assumption. This U, uh, act, uh, formally speaking, that the, Jav uh, the U double uh, prime is of Javery S space, in Javery S space. So under this assumption, if this omega is Javray and uh, has some compact support, then we can we can say that the uh, the linear inverse damping hold, 
and uh, and uh, the we have the scattering result, which uh, after the nonlinear change of coordinate, the velocity uh, vorticity will com converges to its final set, uh, final state. Uh, I would like to give some remarks of this result. The first one is that the the solution should be uh, less regular than the background flow because you can see that in the equation, the background flow will affect to the re, uh, regularity to the solution. So this is a this is a natural uh, phenomenon. And the second thing is that we use a wave operator here to remove the non-local term. This is uh, very interesting. Um, and the third one is that we would like to mention this second uh, inequality, which we have epsilon here, but by using the wave operator, we can recover the epsilon square. So it means that uh, um, the, the final state of omega has some, has some epsilon arrow if you replace it by the final state of the wave operator acting on omega, the, the arrow is epsilon square. So it's much smaller than the perturbation itself. The, uh, another remark I want to mention is that under the same assumption, uh, Jia and uh, Inosco, they proved the similar result by using some different uh, method. Okay, let's uh, go back, uh, go to the Proof. So um, let's go start from the linearized, uh, linearized problem. So this is a linearized Euler equation. We write into the string function form. And uh, when we take a Fourier transform in X, then we finally write uh, our equation in this way. So here, here the R alpha is a linearized, is a linearized operator which closely related to the relay operator in this way. So that means that these two operator will share the same spectrum. So if the, if the string function solves the, the above equation, then by the representation formula, we have this formula for this solution. And uh, this is the initial data. So what we should, uh, here I would like to mention that this counter inter integration is taking uh, when, uh, where this omega is a simple connected domain which contains a continuous spectrum. This is the range of U and this is the uh, omega so that the, all the spectrum of uh, uh, this R alpha is contained in this omega. Of course, we can assume that this R alpha only has continuous spectrum. So it means that we only take the control in this, in, in this narrow range of the very epsilon neighborhood of this continuous spectrum, range of U. Okay, this is the first one. And uh, we also, would, uh, we also uh, have some classic result of the spectrum. First one is the spectrum is compact. And the second one is the continuous spectrum is the range of U. And the third one is, um, is uh, um, the, the eigenvalues cannot uh, cruise except uh, uh, possibly along the, along to the, uh, range of u. It means that uh, if you have the eigenvalue, if you have the eigenvalue, so the eigenvalue is discrete uh, and it, it only has a way that uh, concentrate on this line. Okay, and uh, the third one is that if you, u double prime is convex, then uh, you do not have embedded eigenvalue and also eigenvalues. And the, fir uh, the fifth one is mean that if you the, the wavelength is large enough, then you do not have eigenvalues. So, so these are very classical results of the spectrum. To, um, uh, so 
Anyway, we just uh, go back to the uh, representation formula. And uh, if we uh, let this resolvent equals to I alpha of phi, then the phi will satisfy the uh, famous inhomogeneous relay equation. So we have phi, so the finally the representation formula can be write down in this way. So what we want to do next is we want to um, take a limit of this domain. So uh, let's uh, first solve the equation. To solve this inhomogeneous equation, let's first solve the homogeneous one. So this one, we can find the two type of a, a solution. One is smooth, the other one has singularity. So one at the y, uh, y uh, equals to yc, it behaves, it's smooth, it's y minus yc. The other one has some logarithm singularity. Okay, then by this way, we can, we can write down the inhomogeneous solution by the homogeneous one. So this is the homogeneous type, inhomogeneous type is to solve the equation. This is the inhomogeneous solution which help you to correct the boundary condition. So um, this new is the operator acting on omega. It's only depend on yc. It's a coefficient such as uh, determined by uh, by the boundary condition. So in this way, we put uh, all this inside of the uh, formula, we end up with this. And uh, of course, take the limit. This, um, so this, this identity is, is due to the limiting of absorption lemma. Um, it, I, I, will, I will not go to more details about this. Um, so this, this phi has two parts. The first part is only depend on yc. The second part is like a kernel, so which is this. Also, of course, it also satisfies the uh, inhomo inhomogeneous relay equation, a uh, homogeneous relay equation, but uh, 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 away from the yc. Anyway, um, yeah, so the, to obtain the decay rate, we you just the integration by part and study the regularity of this term. So this is uh, for the linear inverse damping. So how to apply the above argument to the nonlinear problem? That's the issue. So for the nonlinear problem, well, this is a problematic term. It's a non-local non term. And uh, so a natural, a rough, uh, a rough uh, or direct uh, idea is to say that, okay, can we just uh, kill this term? So this is uh, this uh, idea of a wave operator. If we apply the wave operator, we can absorb this term and uh, make this term become local. So this only you multiply uh, the wave operator. So this equation become local and this one is non-local. So for the, for the two uh, self adjoint operators, it's very easy to construct the wave operator by the following way. But here, this, uh, this B is non-self non adjoint. So it's not that easy to apply this method to construct the wave operator. So we give another formal argument. So suppose the B is a self adjoint, then if we have the if we have the omega have the following representation formula, which is a phi is a generalized eigen eigenfunction corresponding to the lambda. It means that the B acting on phi is equals to lambda phi but it's a, it's a generalized eigenfunction. So maybe it's not uh, um, in L2 space or maybe it's not uh, uh, decay in enough. But anyway, you can, you can uh, point-wise they get this kind of a form, uh, formal identity. 
Then let's just uh, put the middle term here, call it a wave operator. So in this way, then the, D, uh, the wave op uh, the D acting on B omega will equals to lambda acting on D omega. So we make this, for example, if, if this B is a non-local, so the D acting on the non-local term become a local operator, which is a lambda multiplied D. Okay, in this sense, actually you can say that if B is a, the derivative D, or the B is a Laplace operator, then the, the Fourier transform is a kind of the wave operator. So what we should do? We can do the same thing if we obtain the same uh, representation formula for this omega. So in, that, in this kind of spread, we have, we first construct the wave operator corresponding to this relay operator, which satisfies that the wave operator acting on the relay operator comes out a local operator, which U multiplies this D of, D of uh, UK. Moreover, we have the representation formula for this D wave operator. So how does this related to the linearized problem. Let's go back to the, this one. This is the omega represented by the D omega here. So let's go back to the, to the representation formula for the string function and take the T equal to zero. Then we have Laplace inverse alpha omega equals to this. So why don't we replace this? We call this our wave operator. So that's the spread of the why, how can we construct the wave operator? Of course, we, we, we also do some mod, uh, modify to make it uh, um, bounded alpha and below to multiply some um, functions. Okay, another thing I would like to mention for the nonlinear problem is the change of coordinate. So suppose our solution behavior as a linearized solution. So then the velocity will converge to its average for the first component. And the second component will converge as one over t squared. What does this mean? It means that if we rewrite the equation of this, the following form, the, uh, this part is the transport part, and the second part is the non-local part. So the non-local term, regard, regardless the regularity, then the non-local term decay as a one over t square. So this is integrable in time, it's good. So the first thing is uh, the, 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 uh, the first part is the transport part. So if we, introduce the character line, then it means that the, the, velo uh, the velocity, the vorticity along this line will become good. What is this line? So this red line, we call it, uh, we, it's a character function of this char character line. And uh, this line, the cis, this straight line is the, is the is a is a is a linearized uh, is a linearized uh, transport equation uh, character line. So it means that the, you you allow this u become zero, and uh, this line, this line, is a line that uh, <coughs> you take uh, u the first component of u become the average of u. <coughs> this one also becomes zero. Uh, any problem? Any questions? Sorry? Okay, all right. Um, let's keep on. So, so finally we introduce the, the following change of coordinate. This is a nonlinear change of coordinate. And uh, we also introduce the uh, omega the, as uh, the, the coordinate after change of coordinate of the uh, spin function. And uh, we then got uh, the Laplace T.
this is uh, coming from the Laplace uh, operator. And our relay operator become a very complicated one after change of, uh, change of coordinate. So the first issue is we, we need to modify our wave operator to adapt the wave operator to the change of coordinate. This is the first issue. And the second issue is also we want uh, our wave operator is easy to estimate because the direct way to to define our wave operator is a, is a wave operator which can responding to this R. But that's, a, that's not easy for us to calculate, to estimate. So finally, we find a way. So uh, the wave operator in the new coordinate, we choose in the following way. Here the V, we keep it, but here we replace this uh, partial y, 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 V by U double prime. So V is close to U. And uh, here, the Y, uh, yes, so the nonlinear change of coordinates, the Y become V, Y become V. But here, I just uh, replace the Y by U minus one. So Y replaced by, by U, U minus one. Okay. So, so after this change of coordinate, we have the, the first thing is that uh, the, the modified relay operator um, acting the wave operator will become V multiply the wave operator. Of course, the wave operator is uh, invertible. And uh, moreover, it's uh, quite important that uh, we have very easy uh, calculation of the wave as uh, a commutator between wave operator and the, the, the time derivative. So by this way, we have the following estimate for the wave operator. The first one is, uh, is uh, the first one is the way, uh, by taking the Fourier transform, we, uh, we have the kernel. And the kernel behavior like exponentially lambda d, it's a, it means that it means that the wave operator or the wave operator will not uh, move the frequency. It uh, only it will not move in this way, but uh, it's just uh, give it uh, uh, make it larger or smaller, but it's not move the frequency a lot. This is quite important. Um, it uh, it uh, formally you can see that the uh, in terms of regularity. Uh, when, when you acting wave operator on some smooth function f, it, mean, uh, it just means that uh, you put a, a smoother function that multiply f, because this, this you can regard it as a, as a Fourier transform of a, a smooth function, smoother function. Okay, so another one is a commutator. So the wave, opti wave, wave operator uh, commute with a smooth function, then we have this. It means that uh, after the change, after the commutator, in the commutator, this guy has some gain, has some gain, uh, gain of the derivative of order two. Okay, this is also important in our estimate. Um, the third one I would like to introduce is uh, uh, the time derivative, uh, time dependent norm, which is A. A has two, uh, three parts. The first part is the Jervais norm, and also we have some sublief correction. And uh, this J term is uh, due to the nonlinear interaction. So in this way, and uh, we introduce our F by um, uh, a good unknown, the F by the the by the following way. The first point is the zero mode. And uh, for the for the uh, high wavelengths, we do not need the acting on uh, acting the wave operator. For small wavelengths, we need to act uh, on the wave acting on the wave op, uh, wave operator. So so the issue now here is that we acting wave operator of both uh, of the both uh, all the terms. So there is a one term that. Uh, the wave operator acting on the nonlinear uh, non term. 
So how to, how to deal with this term? So here we introduce a very uh, interesting phenomenon and a very interesting calculation that uh, we just uh, replace this part, this D, by the D minus one, the dual of D minus one. And then we have some type of the D minus, D minus one, the dual. So later I will mention that this one is just a commutator, is a commutator. And, uh, and the rest part, you can, you can, the rest part, you can integrate, uh, you can take a commutator. This one, the commutator A, A of D and move the D outside. And this one, D minus one and the A uh, have the commutator. D minus one and the A move outside. So by doing so, we can, we can recover the transport structure. This is quite important because um, only by the transport in structure, we can deal with the nonlinear term. So this is, a, this is a, the technical issue in when you apply the wave operator, the key, uh, the key point. Okay, so um, at the last, I would like to mention some tips in the proof. The first one is uh, we use two different uh, characterization of the Javery class. The first one is uh, based on the Fourier frequency. So it's a, uh, I just multiply, it's a multiplier. The second one is a, is a, is a Javery class in physical side. So it's a, just a take a derivatives. You calculate every derivatives and uh, and uh, make sure that the derivative has some bound. So these two norms are not, equ are not equivalent, but they are related. So if you make this cup, uh, k smaller and make this lambda, uh, uh, make this k larger and make uh, this lambda smaller, then you can, uh, make sh you can embed this space to this space. Other, uh, uh, if you make this lambda larger, then this space becomes smaller, and you make this k smaller, you, you make this space smaller, then you can embed this space to this space. So this, these two are uh, related, but they are not equivalent. Okay, the second uh, tip is that we have many ways to, um, to choose a, a good wave operator. As I mentioned here, we, we just uh, um, choose the wave operator uh, which corresponding to uh, modify the relay operator. So different relay operator has some different uh, wave operators. So um, it, a natural way is that to choose this uh, relay operator after change of a coordinate, but uh, this one, you may lose some regularity because you have a second derivative acting on the V and the V is a solution. So you lose more derivatives. So, and uh, the set, uh, also you can do some um, modified uh, wave operator such as you replace this uh, because since you lose derivatives here V, so you can replace it by U double prime and then replace it by V minus one, it's okay. And also you can, you can choose this and, all, and also you can choose the final state. Of course, the final state is, uh, is a formal one. All this has some problem. Uh, the first, uh, some of them are coming from the zero mode. The zero mode uh, um, does not decay enough. And uh, also some commutators with time derivative because you can see that uh, uh, here the V is time dependent. So you, you should uh, take a, into con uh, take into consideration about uh, the the time derivative hit on this v. So some of them are not good, and of course the another issue is uh, the kernel estimate because you do not want to act in the the very complicated uh, this a on the kernel because the kernel is uh, much more complicated than the the equation itself. 
So the wave operator finally we choose is of this form. Yes, so um, the third one is, uh, the third tip is I'm also mentioned in the nonlinear estimate, uh, estimate the nonlinear term. Uh, a natural way to do it uh, is uh, uh, this AD commute with this. So we recover the, com we, we, we recover the uh, transport structure. But anyway, um, it's uh, not a good way to say that because the issue is the wave operator is not going to converge to identity. Okay, that's the issue. I think I should stop here and uh, thank